Welcome to the global phenomenon, Surviving the Survivor, where we bring you the best guests in all of true crime. This is a STS special, Surviving My Biggest Case. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning journalist, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor. Tonight, we bring you a very special STS Nation series called Surviving My Biggest Case, and you know the face. Uh, the best guest tonight is Robin Dreek. He has been on before. He is a best-selling author, a professional speaker, a trainer, an executive coach, a podcast host, a Marine Corps officer, and also a retired FBI special agent. He was chief of the counterintelligence behavior analysis program. One of his many jobs was recruiting spies. We'll get into that a little bit tonight. And he's author of The Code of Trust, and it's not all about me, and just an all-around great guy. Robin, thank you so much for doing this. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, we were just chatting for a minute, and uh, we're going to go through the story of... Uh, 9-11, uh, obviously uh, the most monumental story perhaps of all time, but certainly in our lifetime. So uh, before we get to that, you've done all these different things. You were uh, in the Marines. Uh, how did you transition uh, into the FBI where you were working on uh, the day that that terror attack unfolded? How did I transition? <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was interesting. We had a recruiter. My last duty station in the Marine Corps, I was a captain at Paris Island in South Carolina. I was part of recruit training. I was a company commander and a, I was in charge of if, if any Marines are in the audience that went through boot camp from 1996 on and went through the crucible. The last thing I did in the Marine Corps, I helped design and write the crucible for the final culminating event for the Marine Corps. Anyway, we had a recruiter from the FBI that came down to Paris Island that were interviewing and talking to Marine Corps captains and officers that were looking to get out. And he said, I think Marine Corps officers make good FBI agents. And I was like, what's that mean? What is, what's that even look like? I had no, like a lot of people joined the FBI because it, like, it was their lifelong dream. Nope, not a, my lifelong dream was to be an astronaut. I've, I'm so far off a, a skew of center of where I wanted to be. Um, and I literally only had two questions for him because my generation, I'm a Gen X guy, is born in 68, and we really only care about a few things. Uh, how much money am I going to make? Does my time count towards retirement and that kind of stuff? So I literally asked him when I was 28 years old, um, does all my military time count towards retirement? And he goes, yes. And so when I retired in 2018, I had 32 years of total federal service. As my time at the Naval Academy counted too. And then my other question was, because I really didn't know what I was going to do inside the FBI. I said, so what's the retirement rate? Because I didn't know whether people liked the job or not. And he said, at the time in 96, uh, roughly 95 to 98% of the agents that come on board make it to towards retirement. And I was like, huh, they must like the job. I'll apply. And that's really how it all started. I get assigned to New York field office after new agent training in Manhattan, and I get assigned to work counterintelligence. Uh, and there's a fun little stories about how I got into doing that, but I literally had no idea what it was, but I was assigned to a Russian military intelligence squad, the GRU, and our job was to recruit Russian military intelligence officers, spies at the United Nations that were under diplomatic cover. Wow. How come you didn't, uh, you could have done it. How come you didn't become an astronaut? Because you don't t let a guy that had to take the SAT seven times to just get a minimum score to get in the Naval Academy, major in aerospace engineering. That was a bad combination. So I failed out of aerospace engineering. My eyes went sideways, you know, at the time, um, which was uncorrectable for being a pilot. And I was just one, <laughs> one catastrophe after another academically. But most important thing in life, I always owned it. So I never blamed anyone else. I was like, all right, I got to figure this one out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's the same reason I'm not a doctor, but everyone in my family is. I uh, didn't, didn't do too well on the, on, the, on the science part of the SATs. But, yeah. but we digress. So, uh, um, you know, it's interesting uh, that you were in New York at that time because I was in New York at that time. I'm from New Jersey. And uh, – on 9-11, we had Tracy Walder speak about this. I was actually working uh, at Three World Financial, one of the uh, World Trade Center, adjacent to the World Trade Centers. Uh, and I was on my way in from Hoboken, New Jersey, where I was living at the time. And I, I did see that uh, 
first plane crash, uh, and then they diverted the ferry. So for whatever, this was, you know, you and I are roughly the same age. I didn't have a cell phone with a camera, but for some weird reason, I had two of those yellow Kodak disposable cameras in my backpack. And I have all these crazy pictures of one tower up, one tower down, but I get ahead of ourselves, but it's interesting that uh, we, we meet later in life, but we, you know, who knows if we cross paths then, but I also got ahead of us a little bit. So you're in New York city. Um, that's got to be an adjustment because you were, you're not from New York city. What was that like for you to walk into the biggest city in the world? Yeah. So yes, ish is a good way to put it. So orig- originally, yes, I am from New York. Mm. I was actually born in Manhattan. My, cause oh. my dad is from hell's kitchen, oh. uh, grew up in a lot of poverty, barely got drafted in the Marine Corps, barely got through high school. And he gets his, uh, his girlfriend after the, after the Marine Corps, 1965, he gets out in 1967, gets his girlfriend pregnant. Six months later, I'm, I'm born after they're married. Um, and, uh, and off he's running, uh, trying to make a life for him and his, his girlfriend or now wife. <laughs> and so they then moved to North, uh, North of New York city into Putnam County, where I actually grew up, um, about an hour North of New York city. A lot of New York City firemen and police officers. I grew up during a time in New York because, again, roughly same age. I'll be 55 in a couple months. Um, Son of Sam, Mayor Dinkins, all the craziness in New York City. I swore when I was younger I was never going to work in New York and never drive in New York City. (laughs) And what happens in the FBI? I get assigned to New York City. (laughs) And uh, it was an adjustment. the, The biggest adjustment really was financially coming from South Carolina to New York. I was like, all right, I'll double everything. Nope. It was much worse. I have never been more impoverished in my entire life. I came out of the Marine Corps with no debt and I was so broke. I used to, it's funny. My wife and I talk about this all the time. I've always been industrious because when you grow up with no money, you're always doing some sort of side scheme to make money in order for me to pay my own way when I had lunches or meals with a confidential human source that was I was working for, I had to pay my own way. And I didn't make enough money to buy my own lunch when I'm taking a source out to a meal. This is how screwed up the government is, right? So I was selling Amazon used books online. I had 1,500 books in my basement that I would stop at libraries on the way home, sell them as a reseller on Amazon. I was also a pallbearer, you know, um, because one of the people I, that was a friend of mine in the Marine Corps League in New York, he was killed in the Trade Center. He was part of Truck 4. And I took his place as a pallbearer. Uh, I was hooking up internet for little old ladies in our neighborhood, just trying to make money on the side so I could pay for lunches with confidence human sources to do my job. I don't job. get it. The FBI didn't foot the bill for that? No, not my meal. And then and it was crazy because when I first came to the Bureau, they did not fit my bill. The deductible was I had to pay $11 of my own money for lunch, $22 for dinner. Talk about making an impact. This was like 25 years ago, 30 years ago. I still remember it. After 9-11, they lifted it, said, we will cover all the meals because it's important that we have confidential human sources. Then somewhere along the way towards my retirement, they uh, they they said, you got to pay your own way again. So, <laughs> all right. so, uh, so leave us up uh, just, I don't know, the either the weeks or months before 9-11. What, what are you doing at that point? Yeah, so I came in, I hit New York City in 1997, and I was working the Russian military intelligence squad, and our job was double agent operations, recruitment operations, basically all the hooky spooky spy stuff. I had a, a decent number of competent human sources. We had great operations. One of the guys that I write about in my last book, Sizing People Up, in the book, his name is Leo. I'll just leave, leave it at that for now. He'd been a bureau source for like 25 years. This is a long established, great access agent we had. And he had a network of great people. It's all about networking, creating good, healthy relationships. Because when you're working in the world of counterintelligence and trying to recruit spies, believe it or not, it's not about deception and subterfuge. It's about creating trust and healthy relationships because no one has to do anything for you. And so when 9-11 happens, and I'll talk about that in a second, you're really relying on a network because the only way you get information to solve problems in life is through conversation, through dialogue from someone being willing to share information. All these great cases and intriguing cases you're covering, the investigators are successful because people are willing to share information with them. Yes, we have forensic. Yes, we have all these investigative 
sophisticated techniques we use, but the greatest technique all investigators use is the ability to communicate with others that might not want to give them information. Even when you get a confession, how do you inspire someone to do that? It's about trust. It's about creating a great camaraderie between two people, even though you might not agree with them. <clears throat> so leading up to that, that's what I was doing. 9-11 itself on that day and the pictures I have, I, I literally, for some reason, I had the same Kodak disposable camera with me. Um, you got used to carrying, trying to carry a camera with you because you never knew what you're going to see in New York City. Yeah. And so I'm on the street at 9 a.m., 9.15 a.m., um, getting a cup of coffee with a great friend of mine. And there's 26 Federal Plaza is our office, literally about five or six blocks from the Trade Center, right on Broadway. And uh, heard the, the first plane impact. I looked up to my left. I'm literally looking at Broadway, looking west. And I look up to the left because you see the side of the facade. And it looked like a small plane had hit because this facade was so large and the impact was so small. And my friend and I looked at it, he's a former Army officer, and I was a former Marine Corps officer, and we're, we were not not thinking terrorism at the time. Mm -hmm. We're thinking, that was weird. We're both pilots. We're like looking for clouds. I said, all we could think of is the guy must have had a heart attack. Yeah. Um, that, and, and so we go up to our floor, which is the 25th floor, and we have a clear shot of the Trade Center from the 25th floor, about six blocks away. And I'm watching the smoke and fire expanding in that area, and we have one of the engine companies right across the street from us. We're seeing them respond. That's where my car was parked that day on the street. Mm -hmm. And the only thing going through my mind is, how are they going to put that fire out? Mm -hmm. And as I'm watching from this vantage point, that's right, when it by really the way, started. Just not, yeah. not to interrupt, but I will for one sec, because Tracy yeah. Walder, who I just talked to, reminded me of something. A couple months before that, there was either a New York Met or a New York Yankee who was flying a plane and hit a building. Um, mm. I don't know if you remember that. And he yeah, was, down in Florida, right? No, but it was in New York City. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, and it hit a building in, in – uh, in Manhattan. So people were thinking something along those lines. Right. Anyway, so Tracy and I would have, I had totally forgotten about that. Um, so maybe that was part of the reason people weren't like, oh my God, what is going on? I remember that. I do remember that. I remember yeah. it was kind of hanging off the facade too yeah. of the building. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know, I didn't remember it was a Yankee or a Met, but I do remember when a, a plane hit a building. It was kind of almost common because I think it happened like two or three times. I think there was also one in Miami around the same time period. The small plane were like, what the hell? That's kind of weird. And so the same, the mindset was kind of in the same locked mode at that time when the first plane hit. Mm -hmm. And as I'm watching from our vantage point, watching the smoke and the fire expanding, that's when you started seeing what you thought at the time, because your mind doesn't grasp it at the mind, what I thought was debris starting to fall, and it was bodies. So I, I started counting people jumping, and I was – weirdly, I was trying to time it. I, I was always trying to assess, is this getting better or is it getting worse? And I was trying to time the, the amount of time it was taking for me seeing the jumpers go. And I'd counted eight people jumping from my vantage point um, because you saw the legs and arms flail and it was horrendous to watch. And that's when this fireball came through the South Tower. And that's how close and how rapid that was. And that's when you're like, this is not an accident. This is terrorism. And that's when that's when chaos struck. It, it's the only way to really put it, because just like we all experienced the COVID, there's no standard operating procedure for chaos. Mm. A standard operating procedure can get you to the front line, but very rarely when chaos hits, is there a plan for chaos? That's when training and reps kicks in. And so that's when chaos struck the FBI and, and everyone's doing a thing. So let me stop you right there. So yep. second plane uh, makes impact. And in your mind, at that moment, you knew right away, like you said, Robin, this is 100% a terror attack right now. Yep. Um, you knew that. And so what is the mood or the atmosphere of the office? Because uh, obviously everyone knows that second plane has struck at that point. What, what does everyone start doing? I'll tell you, it was really strange. Uh, it was mixed. It was mixed with the people that had reps. I'm a big person. I'm when it comes, I, I mention a lot all the time, is reps, repetitions. Mm -hmm. We're all born pretty much the same. We have this arc that starts in our lives earlier from the experiences we have that form what it is we do in life. And then it's about repetitions, what we have along the way. 
So in our office, you have people that are former military like myself, former Marines, former Army. You have some people that have never done anything else. You have some people that only have a couple months in a bureau, some people that have 25 years in a bureau. You have some people that have been in executive management. You have some people that haven't. So you have all this mix of things. I knew some people that ran home. They ran away. I knew some people that hid um, because they're terrified. I knew some people freeze, fight or flight kicked in. They didn't know what to do. Uh, I can tell you that the Marines on the on the floor, there's about eight to 12 of us that were former Marines. We all gathered together rapidly. We went down to our boss's office, who was acting at the time because our our boss that had that had been ours, uh, SAC John O'Neill was his name, had just gotten killed in the Trade Center. We didn't know it because he had just retired and moved over as chief of security at the Trade Center. He was my boss's boss. And so we go down to the acting's office, all the Marines, and we say to them, we say, hey, boss, the Marines are here. What do you need? He says, if you fear for your life, run. No shit. That's what, I'm sorry for my language, but that's no, when I said, all right, I'm done with you. And so, so we had a small group of people. We started securing desks. We started securing safes. People, are so early in the morning, a lot of agents would leave guns in drawers. You know, we, so we were, we were securing all we could because the only memories that we had was Oklahoma City. When the Oklahoma City Federal Building went down, there's FBI papers all over the place mm. because safes were open. So literally we were... Also hearing rumors at this immediate time that there's a truck bomb inbound to our building. And so in the first few moments, we were securing things. We're trying to get on the radio to the command center and try to get instruction for what we're going to do as a response, how we're organizing. So you're, we're getting a lot of conflicting information. So you so were securing small- like classified doc- things that yep. you wouldn't want the terrorists to get their hands on. Not the terrorists necessarily, because we didn't think we were, anyone's coming to take our documents. But we, the fear was our building was going to get hit. Uh-huh. It was going to get exploded, go down, and our and all these all these classified documents be flying all over the city. Wow. So that and so we're securing that we're trying to find people because we didn't know who was where because it's early in the morning. A lot of people are still exercising. They're out. They're getting coffee. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to find and identify people. I made a pact with another Marine on my squad is a senior guy. Uh, Mike's his name. He had been a, a, a Marine vet during Vietnam, a case on. We made a pact to stay together because uh, we didn't want to if the building got hit and got collapsed, we didn't want to die alone. And, and that's that literally what's going through your mind. You wanted to at least be with someone mm-hmm. uh, if you're trapped and couldn't get out. And so those are the first probably first hour after what was going on. Wow, that's heavy. That's heavy. So, um, you know, it takes a little bit of uh, time for news to travel, but you're in lower Manhattan. So uh, you're you're at the epicenter. Um when do you start to kind of like mobilize outside of the building to see, you know, how you can help around uh, what's now known as Ground Zero? Yeah, th- multiple things are going on at the same time on this. I had a pretty good vantage point because I could see from our vantage point at 25 on our 25th floor, we had a group of agents, probably about two or 300 that kept getting moved around um, by the command center to respond. We had we had set up a command center down close to Ground Zero that got moved back when the tower collapsed. A lot of people got just destroyed. They didn't die, luckily, from the collapse, but just covered in all the debris. Cars were lost. We had a lot of our bureau cars on the street. I had a my car was pretty close to the ground zero. I had an engine that struck the south the plane that struck that south tower. The engine from that landed about thirty feet from my car. So we ha- we're having agents kind of moving all around looking for a direction. But I'll to the cr- so I told you all the things that went sideways. To the credit, by the time I left because we started. They established shift work right away. Probably within about four hours, we were uh, we designated that all right. We're going to be on two shifts, day shift and night shift. Six a.m. to midnight, midnight to six a.m. were the two shifts, and designated what's going on there. They moved our command center to two ninety Broadway, which is right across, and then we lost comms there, and so we moved. We literally worked off the Intrepid, the Air and Space Museum, the aircraft carrier Intrepid. So we moved to that the next day. That's how fast we moved out um, because we had no comms in lower Manhattan. Let me stop and, you for one quick yep. second. Yeah, because I remember all, all the all the communication was out. Um, how, um, like you're talking about chaos, right? And no one's prepared for chaos. How in the world do you sort of, for lack of a better word, organize this like how i mean i guess it's training but how 
there's got to be a command you know center set up but that's just for the fbi you working with all the federal agents how how does how do you set up how does anyone figure out how to organize this is my question <laughs> i'll tell you no matter what anyone in the world thinks of law enforcement i got my goosebumps thinking about it the thing that saved new york that day was nypd mm. I have never seen a more organized group of individuals with a structure that was set up for chaos in my entire life. I went, so imagine this, they locked down that, they locked down the entire city of Manhattan, canceled all flights because they, they control the Port Authority and, and, and in conjunction with NYPD, control the airports. And yes, AFA can, but they can, but they actually control the airports. They control the bridges. They control everything. When I went home at uh, six o'clock that day to start that first shift, and uh, I showed you earlier, here's a picture of me looking towards the west on Broadway from where I office was. That is a trade center with the sun setting on 9-11 yeah. from that disposable camera. <laughs> when I went home that day, there wasn't a car on the entire highway. Not one. I was the only one because I was law enforcement. They They were so organized. Their command center was so set up. And so we all basically followed lead with them. Mm. And we were communicating by handheld radios because back then, so here's the funny thing that people forget. I had a beeper. Mm -hmm. This was 1997 and the federal government generally is behind everyone. I had a beeper and some people on the squad had Nextel uh, cell phones. Uh -huh. uh, if you had case funds that could pay for. So we were not really fully in the cell phone age yet. Mm -hmm. Definitely no Zoom calls. And so we had a lot of word of mouth through radio traffic. You know, have one person report the command center that was set up to pass the word to everyone else. We literally sat in a place on the floor on the Intrepid waiting for word to come to us just just messenger wise. And so it, that was the way the world was back then. Wow. So um, so you guys start these shifts midnight to 6 a.m., 6 a.m. to midnight. And uh, so you were heading I guess you were living outside the city and you were heading home to get some rest before your first shift the next day would start. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, my first shift started, so I was on the 6 AM, the midnight shift and it, it that, and that was seven days a week. It lasted until late November, no days off. No. And that did not count in commute time. You could only go home and finish your shift when your lead was covered. Cause every day you waited for a lead that you had to cover, if not multiples. And they generally gave you your last lead at midnight which is generally talk to someone that saw something or knew something. And so try to get a hold of someone at midnight and, and you couldn't go home to the lead was covered. It was just, it was horrible. I've never been more exhausted in my entire life. Um, and so that was the way the shifts work. And, and so this is where you start after a couple of days of, of kind of letting it coalesce and figure out, all right, we're working now we're working a problem. And part of the things we have to do is we have to talk to confidential human sources. We've got to start piecing together a puzzle, one of what happened and two, what could happen. And so in the world, and this is where the world of those that us worked at counterintelligence really started, I think, flourishing in the fact that when you work in the world of counterintelligence and intelligence work, you're not reactive. You always got to be proactive. You got to be left of bang. You got to be out in front because you're got to be an innovator because innovation solves problems before they happen. Because if you're reacting in our world, you've already lost and you'll be conquered by a nation state that has does not have our best interests at heart. So we started and I started thinking about my my sources that I had that were working Russians, kind of like Tracy was saying, and redirecting them onto Russians. I mean, onto Middle Easterners. Mm -hmm. And the crazy way the systems work was. I could not do anything on my own initiative because we're under such control now um, by higher headquarters. And I literally had to call my own tip in to a tip line for the FBI to create a lead that could then be assigned to me so I could go talk to my confidential human source. That's I had to work the system in order to do that. It was crazy. That's so did I hear that right? You called the FBI tip line to create a tip that you could work. Yes. So I could go talk to my source because my source, what I did was I called this, this long established source of ours who said, hey, Leo, we're done working Russians. we got to work Middle East. And about a week later, he said, hey, Robin, I have a guy. He's the brother of one of the leaders of a Middle Eastern country. I think he might be a good conversation to have. Wow. And so in order to be able to do that, I had to call the tip line <laughs> and get that assigned to me. <laughs> <laughs> How did you know it would get assigned to you if you called the tip line? 
um, I had to work both angles. I had to call the tip line and then I had to call my supervisor who's working a tip line at the same time. When you see this come in, make sure it gets assigned to me. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Okay. Which also then, and so that goes back to the, the original thing we were saying at the beginning. That requires relationships. That requires trust. It requires the ability to communicate. And that's not relying on technology. That's not relying on hope, you know, hope and prayers that the systems that we put in place and technology works. No, that is literally knowing the system, not judging it as right or wrong, but just saying, here's what I have to work with. I have to work the problem. I have to solve this problem. Here's my tools that are available, as screwed up as they might be. I have to work this. And so this is, you said, the brother of the leader of a Middle Eastern country. Is that right? Yeah, somewhere like that. Sorry. I gotta protect the names of the innocent, but yeah, it was it was a uh, it was yeah, it was it was pretty unique, is what it was. <laughs> and, and and had and had it who who tipped you off to this? Are you able to say my confidence human source that uh, had worked Russians for us, but he was a great networker of people, and so he he had knew, known this guy. So when I called my source uh -huh. right after nine eleven, about a day or two later, I said, "Hey, um, we don't care about Russians right now, like Tracy was saying. We care yeah. about anyone from the Middle East. Go." Mm -hmm. And so he kind of retools himself, his mindset, and he came up with this individual amongst others that we chatted with. But this was a probably good one for us at the time. And so I know that a lot of this is obviously like classified, confidential, et cetera, et cetera. But so wh what can you tell us? How do you start to work that source? Like, how do you even begin to work that? He had a challenge. He had a priority and a pain point in his life, believe it or not. he. Th so this guy was extremely intelligent, grew up in the intelligence. He has bought, went to um, the British Naval Academy for things. I mean, so it's a, it's a very high level, very highly intelligent, uh, educated individual because obviously he's related to world leaders. And But he had a need, a priority in his life of – he was out of the country for something for – I, I won't say exactly what it was, but he, he needed a license to do something. And so my friend, my confidential human source says, this might be a good way for me to do an intro that you can solve his problem for him. Mm -hmm. So wh what I did was I called the, there was a, uh, a town clerk in the city of Yonkers that I had another relationship with because of other stuff I was doing. I said, hey, you have an opportunity to do something really patriotic during 9-11 if we can do this together and I can get this guy a license. Again, it was totally legit. There was nothing nefarious about it, but I needed to move someone to the front of the line in order to protect national security of the world. <laughs> and he's like, hell yeah, I'm in. And so I was able to solve this guy's problem. So at our first meeting, uh, when I met him uh, for a cup of coffee, I said, by the way, here. I heard you had a challenge. I, I was able to solve that problem and challenge for you. And then the conversation was really about the most interesting things in the world. Favorite family holidays and traditions growing up. Wow. Wow. And we were off and running. I, I have a question. Um, there, are, you know, there's only one Robin Tree, but there are a lot of FBI guys, agents during this time and CIA. Um, so you're working this one person. How would you guys like, on a large scale coordinate, how would you know, okay, Robin is talking to this guy, uh, Tracy Walder and the CIA is talking to this person. Um, how does all that stuff get coordinated and filtered out? And how do you know that you're not doing double work or, you know, or um, not following a, you know, the right lead? Like, let's say you're talking to someone, I'm just picking a I don't know. Let's say you're talking to the brother of the leader of Kazakhstan, but Kazakhstan has nothing to do with it. You're, you're, how, do you, how do you coordinate everything so you know right. you're on the right track? Sometimes it's a wing and a prayer. Um, so the typical leads that you'd get. So this one I knew was just me mm -hmm. because it's very singular in nature because I created it. So I knew there was no overlap. No one else was talking to him. And also because I was, I asked him, I said, Is it, are you talking to anyone else? Mm -hmm. Typically, especially in during these high tempo operations, you will ask, has anyone else ever contacted you? Have you ever talked to anyone from the U.S. government before? I generally lead off with that. But you're also supposed to do all the checks ahead of time to deconflict with our confidential um, source unit. So there's lots of ways you can try to double check that again, but times were a little chaotic, so you didn't have a chance to do that. But now when the lead, the other leads came in that you're being assigned to like, I was assigned lead two of, of Pent Bomb, it was called at the time. Lead two was individual seas plane flying down the Hudson River. And I'm like, no kidding, you and 5 million other people. Mm -hmm. But literally, you have to cover it because it comes in to the tip line. Generally, mm -hmm. 
it it goes to a central processing place for these leads um but the system was a bit broke mm -hmm. and they would give out multiple leads and there was a lot of there was a lot of overlap literally what you started learning after a period of time if you got a lead and you waited two hours someone else had generally covered ahead of you and then you could just move on to the next one because it was that much overlap and also by the time that things were up and running it's like when i bumped into and we had a lead to talk to this one individual that um just show, basically whenever a conflict breaks out in the world uh, what the fbi does is we interview everyone from that country or everyone in, in related countries because you never know who someone might know i literally bumped into um and interviewed the um the dentist one of the former dentists of saddam hussein and this guy, um, but on that, when I was covering that lead, who was with me, I had someone from the DIA with me. Uh, I had, I think I had an NYPD guy with me too. So a lot of times by the time these things were gelling and, and we're figuring out how to work together as a, as a one entity, anytime a lead came in that looked like it was maybe higher significance, you generally got partnered with people, um, whether it was someone from the military, DIA, CIA, uh, NYPD was generally with you as well a lot of times because everyone's got a lot of different resources they can bring to bear to fight the challenge. Kind of like, so we'll bring it back to true crime type stuff, mm -hmm. like the Brian Koberger case. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a great example of you had one single point of failure or success, which was that uh, investigator, the corporal, that was a young guy that led that investigation. But he had a lot of other resources, federal, state, that were he's actually managing because every entity brings all these different skill sets, tools, and resources to bear. And so we're doing the same thing during 9 11. What was uh, Saddam Hussein's dentist doing in New York? That's what I want to know. <laughs> he had he had he had fled um, before this had happened, and so his his former dentist. Um, he was from a he was from a political affiliation that was not uh, in favor, and so he fled for his life. And so I think he was, if I remember, he's here on asylum probably. Mm -hmm. But the neat thing was, he was he knew what Saddam Hussein was generally would do during these times of conflict, and the way he would kind of bounce around Embassy Row uh, to try to avoid being caught. And so the DIA guy took that information within like two hours. Bunker busters were kind of going what what we had told them. So they were, you know, so the information we were gathering got pretty actionable pretty quickly when you started seeing it on the news really really fast. It was pretty amazing. So, so now you're you're in contact with your source, who is the brother of a world leader, uh, I presume, in a Middle East region, and you have a boss. Are you now? Do you have to debrief your boss uh, often? Does he know exactly what's going on? Yeah, that became probably the greatest aha challenges I was dealing with. Because so let's reverse the optic. I love the human behavior side of these things. You can take all the things that make sense when you we sit here in an armchair, but in reality. People have to trust you. And so here I was. I came in the bureau in 1996, 97. This is 2001. That's not in 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 the world of reps. That's not, you know, I had decent reps, but come on, are we going to let this young guy? First of all, when this happened, I, I was a counterintelligence agent in New York. That is not high on the pecking order of credibility in the New York field office, which generally works white collar crime, um, organized crime. It's a criminal organization. The FBI is a criminal organization, not criminal, it's an organization that investigates criminal organizations. Yeah. <laughs> um, and as, as a pecking order, especially prior to 9 11, we were third rate citizens. And so we were under the direction of criminal. Um, all, uh, criminal guys that were running these investigations and so we were low rung and so i was re i was providing information through my counterintelligence boss to a criminal guy who's running the investigation who's then passing it up and so how do you then think in terms of getting this guy my boss's boss who works criminal matters who doesn't even regard what you're doing as a counterintelligence agent again with only like five or six years in with, with this kind of high level thing. And so it really took a lot of dialoguing, massaging, building my own credibility, who I was going to work with on this to build that, hey, okay, we can trust him with this. And then also is this guy who he says he is, because he's kept out of the public spotlight. So this guy who claims he's this close relative of this leader, 
he, we're not really finding him anywhere in any databases or any searches. And so how do we actually believe he is who he is? And so there's a lot of that gyrations going on that I had to do really rapidly. So not only was I developing and try to read the trust of this guy that we're now talking to who's claiming to have this direct access, but how do I get my bosses, one, to allow me to do it, and two, to actually listen to what this guy is saying because maybe it actually is credible. So, And uh, how, how do you corroborate that? Do you eventually have to ask to see photos? I mean, how do you figure that out? Is it a DNA uh, thing? Of, bunch of different ways. Uh, CIA came into play a lot on this one where we're sending information over through, um, through the station um, to the chief of station over in uh, Islamabad. Uh, or in any other places that this guy might have tra traveled in and out of, uh, whether it's Delhi or, or anywhere else, mm -hmm. Tunisia. You know, so you're dealing with chiefs of station all over the world to try to corroborate information that someone's saying to say, yeah, this looks like it may be uh, valuable and true or not. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, so where are we in terms of the timeline? How, how long after 9-11 now? October. To oh, October so 2001, pretty rapidly. Pretty rapidly. So... And then now what's your like kind of what's your end game here in your mind? Like, what are you trying to achieve at this point? Yeah. So the, you're playing such a small part in such a big operation, which most of these big true crime things are, you know, everyone plays. Um, I wasn't the I call it the single point of success or failure. I wasn't the case agent for it. I was just one of the spokes on the hubs. And all you're doing, the, the key motivation there every single day, when you're going through all the checkpoints, trying to go into the office or trying to go down to ground zero, you're going through multiple checkpoints, getting, getting down there. And uh, matter of fact, here's, I think I got a photo of one of them. And every day you're, you're faced with this signs yeah. that are being held up. You remember you were there. Yeah. The West side highway was riddled with people holding up signs, having candlelight vigils 24 seven. And when you see kids on the sidewalk holding up signs, please find my daddy, please find my mommy. Mm -hmm. Every day you think I didn't do enough to try to save the world. You literally are trying to do all you can to make a difference to try to save the world. And you're thinking at really a macro level too high mm -hmm. because can one person save the world? No. But you can make a difference one person at a time. And so after a period of time, all I was trying to do, all of, all of us are trying to do is hopefully provide one little thing that can make a difference to keep the world safe today and cool. not let this happen again. So that was the, the end game I had was literally just try to do all I could. And also... We, we established a, a decent back channel. Uh, we thought because we were putting information reports out and I had a few returns from uh, Donald Rumsfeld who was the Secretary of Defense at the time. So I had a couple of returns on a few things that we had sent in for Rumsfeld came back with more questions for more follow up. So we knew we were making an impact. Wow. And you, you held up before uh, you have that piece of glass. Yeah. So this was one of the things, this is from the World Trade Center, and I actually know exactly where it's from. This is a, an edge of a window from Windows in the World, which was at the very top of the towers. Wow. One of the things that you never knew what you're going to do every day during, during this, um, when you're sitting in the lead pool, which meant you're just sitting on the Intrepid, you know, the aircraft carrier, waiting to be told what you're going to do that day. Some days you're out at JFK Airport dragging people off of planes that are had name hits that came in. I remember one day they had just this like three days after they had just opened up the airspace again. My friend and I uh, went out there because we've got a lead that someone's coming in on a British Airways flight with a name hit from India. And so we get out there, they literally lock down all the airports again and they, and we, they have us go on the aircraft. They wanted to punch out the chutes and everything out to get everyone. I said, the guys already landed. It were fine. It was, it was a guy in flip flops with a trash bag with him before his was <laughs> trying to immigrate. It, it was like, it's like the name hit was like the equivalent of John Smith. I mean, yeah. it was really, it was, and so either doing that. And then other days we're out of fresh kills landfill where they hand you a steel rake and they say, go find fingers and toes and, and biologicals that you can give back to family members, anything. And so this is one of those days which are out of fresh kills. Uh, wound up that's in on, my uh, out on Staten Island. Staten Island. That's, that's where they brought all the, boy, I got to find that that's picture. Not far from my home in New Jersey right there. And that's where they brought all the debris from the Trade Center. I don't have it there. It is acres upon acres and miles of just nothing but concrete and rebar. And they give you a steel rake and say, go. <laughs> wow. So you'd be doing that as well? Yep. Wow, wow, wow. Um, but is your 
at this time, is your singular focus kind of on this brother of this world leader? Is that remain like how long does he remain in your in your crosshairs, if you will? Um, we're still friends today. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, that's um, amazing. So, yeah, the, yeah, and that is amazing. The that's why I love working what I've worked because when you form real relationships, because I wasn't dealing with the, the scum of humanity when you work counterintelligence, you're dealing with highly intelligent people that a lot of times they just don't have your same political views on what the state of the United States should be (laughs) compared to their own. But they're really, they're family people that care deeply, their healthy relationships they have with the organizations, things they do with, they just have a different agenda in the world. Um, But this individual, yeah, it was interesting because once I was able to establish his credibility, I started having a little bit more flexibility on being able to service that. Again, but it had to be a lead I created in order to go talk to him to get more information. Again, this was, these weren't daily debriefs. They were happening like once every couple of weeks or so. Um, and so every day I was going in to do the, the go yanking people off planes, go you know, we had a business card that was found in, a, in an abandoned car with someone with a uh, Arabic name that you had to go to, to talk to their doctor. You had to go out to Fresh Hills Landfill. All the routine stuff every day was that. And then every once or, once every two weeks or so, I got to go talk to this guy. So it was intermixed with everything else. Wow. Um, and so how does, um, you know, as the months start to pass, uh, does the work, like does the workflow remain as steady or how did things start to shift? I don't know, like six months later, did things start to change at that point a little bit? Finally, six months later about that. Yeah, it was, it was relentless. I, being a Marine, you really recognize that combat mentality when you're in combat and you have that exhaustion. I mean, we, there are moments I've never laughed so hard in my life during this because th- it becomes so exhaustingly ludicrous. Some of the things that you're dealing with, and you know, when you get that that dark humor going for survival, that's when you know you're in you're in a lot of stress. And so that happened. And, but it did about six months later, about ish, there was never a defining day. It was like, all right, we're all back doing this. Um, probably when the Bureau finally decided we're, cause at the time when this happened, we had what's called national security division, where the guys that work terrorism and counterintelligence were all part of the same group. But one of the things that happened after 9-11 is they split. And so you then had counterintelligence division and counterterrorism division. So when this split happened, I don't remember exactly. It was about six months later where they kind of bifurcated us so we could actually go back to focusing on the fact that you can't have everyone that works counterintelligence work in terrorism because you're going to ignore this threat over here unless you get back to working it. Because the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, all these people are still do not have our best interest in at heart. And if you're ignoring them, that's also bad. So, but you're right. Around six months later, we started migrating back to doing our primary. Did, did you spend any time at uh, ground zero at all? Uh, lots. After the att- lots, which yeah. by the way, you and I were talking about healthy lifestyles before we went on the air. And uh, I remember, uh, cause of course, America, there's just a volunteer carrying water for everyone and that. And so oh. this is why we all have lung issues because she is only wearing that with that air down there. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So I remember uh, they had to open the stock exchange. The attack happened on a Tuesday and the following Tuesday, the New York Stock. I was a business reporter back then. And I mm-hmm. just remember, forget seeing tanks in New York City because there were tanks and, and uh, National Guard everywhere. But that odor that smell that acrid smoke on my walk yeah. up they also had to move the ferry spot so i i was now coming instead of coming in on the west side of manhattan i was coming in from the southern tip of manhattan yep walking up to the stock exchange and man you would see national guardsmen in their gas masks but that smell was unbelievable it was like a smoldering tin can is what you know what it smelled like with the smell of death it was i will never forget that it was combination especially when you go out to fresh kills um we were in sludge up to your 
knees a lot of times. So it was a combination of the, like you said, the, the burnt acrid smell combined with it was incinerated bodies, as you knew. And as well as when those towers came down, that's a lot of sewage in there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that was burned and incinerated. So it was a very unique smell. I, I'm with you. And yeah, I'm on a lung monitoring program for it. A lot of people have lost their lives afterwards from that stuff um, because the respirators and the garbage they, they might give us sometimes was not doing their job, no doubt. Did you say that you're being monitored? Did you say yeah, that? Yeah, I'm on the monitoring thing. I actually have right here. Is my certificate says that, yes, uh, I was there during Ground Zero and I'm on the monitoring program and all that. Wow. Um, yeah, that's some scary stuff right there. Um, did you know people who who died that day? Lenny Hatton. Who's that? Sorry. So the, um, two FBI agents died that day. Um, one had just retired, John O'Neill, and then Lenny Hatton it was the other one. A lot of people knew Lenny because when you first go to New York, um, the first thing you're assigned to do as a new agent was to be on the applicant squad. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can learn the city. So you're interviewing applicants, you know, for federal or, or FBI positions that to kind of get to know the city. And the squad that was right next to the applicant squad was the bank robbery task force. Mm-hmm. Lenny Hatton was on the bank robbery task force. So a lot of times if you're going to go out and do something to get experience, the bank robbery task force, if they had something to do, they'd grab a bunch of new agents on the applicant squad and say, come with us. And so I had met, I wouldn't call them friends, but I knew exactly who Lenny was, recognized him around the office. He's a, one, of those, one of those guys that was a volunteer fireman on the side, a, a, an amazing former Marine, just a do-gooder. Um, and so he ran down to the towers when it happened. Again, one of these great people that ran towards – the the mayhem was actually in the towers when they collapsed yeah one of the weirdest things to me was there was a whole world underneath the world trade center so before yep. it collapsed like we used to go down there there was a mall underneath and we used to have lunch and sit down there uh below the trade center and now when you go to ground zero like you didn't realize how big that footprint was uh in manhattan it's just a very like i can't all these years later, I still can't really process it, um, you know, and I had nothing to do with it other than, you know, I was supposed to be at work that day and got stuck. Um, but, uh, you know, no one knew the extent of it. I remember that I was a reporter and uh, my boss wanted me to get into Manhattan to report on this. Um, and like like you said, the NYPD sealed off that city almost immediately. You couldn't get any bridge or tunnel access. Yeah. Um one of the things I do remember, kind of like a PTSD thing, was after it opened back up, uh, there were all kinds of issues with the southern part of Manhattan. So there was always these like incredibly long lines at the Holland Tunnel and Lincoln Tunnel. And man, I used to have a hard time. I was like sitting in miles of traffic. People don't realize this who are not from New York City. I mean, miles of traffic. You like bend around especially when you're coming into the Holland tunnel. Um, and I would get right up to the, to the, like, the, the opening of the tunnel. And I was like, Oh man, I'm going to be in bumper to bumper traffic for like over a mile in a tunnel with like people that want to kill us. And I just remember like being so nervous, like just the, it was, it was weird. It was definitely like, now that I think about it, it was definitely like a form of uh, post-traumatic stress because the whole city, um, kind of reeled after that, you know, like we didn't know what was coming and when it was coming, but one of like, you know, with all horrible things, there's usually a silver lining. And and for that, it was definitely, um, and I'm sure you can speak to this, Robin was the country was actually united. Uh, it wasn't like what we're seeing. It's unbelievable what we're seeing today when you think of what it was like back then. Right. I mean, yeah. Right. There was no politics. It was, I, I, especially being, in this area at the time and having been in the bureau a while and knowing what people were willing and not willing to do for you to help you. Cause again, you want to, you want to have the world against you. One, be in the federal government to be an FBI guy, be in New York city and no one has to talk to you. I mean, you had a lot of things lined up against you. So it really took uh, having a great personality and, and to try to create relationships with people to try to give you information that doesn't have to give you any information. That's the challenge of counterintelligence work is no one has to tell you anything or have a conversation. I remember just how everyone was such a team 
I got that. I kind of alluded to earlier. We got this lead. Actually, we had gone to this abandoned car because someone called in. Hey, there's an abandoned car, and we're. I, you want to talk about looking at every nook and cranny? We even looked at abandoned cars. We searched abandoned cars, and if there is a business card that had a doctor's name with a Muslim name or on a business card or something, we went and interviewed everyone on that because they did everything, covered everything, and so I went to followed on this business card it was someone we didn't know it was some muslim sounding name arabic salmon i don't even know what i don't know nationalities very well <laughs> at the time but it had a doctor that served as a doctor at roosevelt hospital in manhattan and so our lead was to go talk to the doctor at the hospital to find out who this individual was tell us about this person on the on, on the business card that's all the lead was and I remember talking to my friend uh, Drew, and I said, "There's no way in living hell these doctors with HIPAA, with all their privacy acts or anything, are going to tell us anything. But in order for us to close a lead, we just have to make the effort, and then we can put down unwilling to share because of X and X." We set up the meeting, called them on the phone. They said, "Sure, no problem. Come on in." And we will go in the next day. And Joel, I've never seen anything like in my entire life. From one business card, one name. On the superfluous thing, we had 15 people in a conference room that all had interaction with this one individual. And the doctor that had served as his doctor was on sabbatical in France. They had him on a conference call. And they said, what do you want to know? Wow. I was dumbfounded. And I said, is he a good guy? I mean, literally, because if, <laughs> and we see this when we work true crime things. Yeah. You can, it's easy to tell, you know, not all bad people are going to do bad things, but good people generally don't. <laughs> yeah. And so the first question I always have working espionage cases or working anything, I was like, do you like him? Because that's the first indicator. And if you have a group of people that generally like someone, they're probably not doing really horrible things. They might be doing some things a little off, but they're not doing horrendous things like flying planes into buildings. And so my first and only question was, what do you think about this guy? They all loved him. They couldn't say enough about him. What do you want to know about him? In other words, when someone's offering you full transparency, honesty, and openness, the likelihood of this person being a bad person is really low. But it was just a profound coming together to help solve a question, one question was really profound. I'll not, I probably will never see it again the rest of my life. Wow. Hopefully. So what's um like what's the biggest lesson in terms of uh recruiting spies which you've done in your career? What what do you who makes a good spy? What you know, what kind of characteristics? Uh well, first it's uh, what makes a good spy is uh access is number one thing. <laughs> you have to have access to things that are of interest. Yeah. So th there's two, there's a couple of questions in there. I'll, I'll try to separate them out. Uh -huh. What makes a good spy is someone who's a risk taker. There's no doubt. You have to be a risk taker. And, but you also have to have a lot of intelligence. As, as we see in the true crime world, a psychopath and a narcissist, they're not all the same flavor. Because, you know, as we've seen some of these cases recently, you can have the highest level of narcissism or psychopathy where someone's really born to be a serial killer, but if they're a complete idiot, they suck and they're going to get caught. Hmm. Then you have the Ted Bundys um, hmm. out there that have been doing it for years because they're higher intelligence and they have that same personality trait. So when hmm. it comes to being a spy uh, themselves, you have to have high intelligence and you actually have to be a risk taker and there's all these other things uh, that need to be in place. But the number one thing when you're trying to recruit the spy, so let's look at the other side, is uh, always remembering if you're doing it like I do it, there's lots of other ways. Some people use manipulation and they'll think in terms of those things and it's not me. Because what I learned from 22 years of reps of doing this is that if you're going to inspire someone, because inspiration has come from within, to have a relationship with you where they're giving you information that might not be in their best interest to give their countries um, and give it to you, it has to be in their best interest, according to them. In other words, you have to be able to solve a priority challenge or pain point in someone's life. In other words, that they you have to find the person, like if I'm trying to recruit an intelligence officer, that one of their challenges in life is that they don't want their children growing up, growing up under Putin. They have elder care issues. They have, they have some sort of priority in their life that I have a solution for. And that solution is I can give you resources for your children's education, for your health care and welfare, for your family members, whatever it is. I need to have a solution. That's the number one thing. But the most important thing is can they trust me with their lives? 
and they're not going to trust anyone that is trying to manipulate them, that's trying to use subterfuge or deception. I mean, just do a thought experiment there. If someone is trying to say, say you have a traumatic event in your life, Joel, that, you know, your mom, use your mom as an example, you know, something that's always, that's always traumatic. <laughs> it is right. You no, know, but something traumatic in your life and you're looking for an individual that's going to solve that problem, solve that pain point, solve that challenge with you. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, can you trust them? Can you trust them with the, with your life? with your reputation, with your brand of you and your family, not just for you and your generation. So there's always those two, two edge, two sides of that. You have to solve a problem and you have to be the person they trust to solve that problem. Mm, super interesting. Uh, so I asked Tracy this, um, I asked her if she thinks that there will be, if it's, if it's inevitable that there will be another terror attack here in the United States, what, what are your thoughts? Hmm. Not the same way. Yeah. Very rarely do things happen twice at that magnitude in the same way because people become really alert to it. And so very rarely do things happen the same way twice. But will it happen again? Uh, world's a very old place. <laughs> things things always repeat in the world. Where and how, they always change. But yeah, history always repeats itself. It's interesting. She said the exact same thing. She said uh, there will invariably be another terror attack on the United States because um, well, I'll get to this in a second, but she said exactly what you said. It won't be the same uh, mechanism for the attack. Uh, it'll be something different that we're not thinking of necessarily right now uh, that hopefully we will think about. Um, but uh, it has changed so much. I just had a thought that just slipped right out of my mind, which will come back to me in a second. Um I'm sorry, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen your moment here, but um, I don't know any. So, any from you, any final thoughts um, in terms of how the world has since um, you know adapted and moved on from nine eleven? I mean, I think there is obviously you know anywhere you go in the subway, still all these years later. And by the way, it feels like it happened yesterday. Um, yeah. But all these years later, to, you know, see something, say something, that kind of thing. Um, you know, do you think we've kind of learned a lesson about heightened awareness and, uh, being on our, you know, on the lookout for potentially uh, an attack, knowing that we're, you know, uh, vulnerable to that. I, I remember, uh, what I was going to say, uh, which was, um, no, I'll leave it out at that. How about your final thoughts? <laughs> um, this kind of goes back towards what the great work that you do on the show, and that is highlighting these incredible cases of trauma traumatic things that are going on. And I think it's such a a popular thing these days, true crime and what's going on and what's being covered in the news and media. And I think that some people might fear and have the impression that the world's a much less safe place today than it was years and years ago. But I'm a great study of history. Matter of fact, the, my recent read is on, um, you want to talk a big one. <laughs> I'm reading Grant. So I'm reading, I'm reading Grant right now. Um, but if you look at history of, of our planet, of our species, we are in the safest time to live that we've ever been as a species. Violence against each other as a race, as a as race, and I talk about the human race. Violence against each other and death from violence against each other as an all time low now than it's ever been throughout our history, recorded history. Oh. And so, as bad as it is, as bad as we see these true crime things, um, it's better now than it's ever been because we're really more educated about it. I think also this generation's nine eleven was COVID. Yeah. And we learned a lot from 9-11 that won't happen again. And hopefully we're learning the same thing from COVID. A lot of, a lot of the things and a lot of the horrendousness we're seeing event, uh, with man against man that we're seeing in a lot of the true crime world is a lot of the, the mental trauma that's happened because of COVID. Yeah. I, I definitely see the, the mental trauma that people have experienced moving through, trying to work through. Um, and so I think that's going to be the lesson learned that society takes from COVID is the lockdowns and all that we went through as a society had major impacts on our mental health. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we've learned from that. The pandemic side, yes, but more so on the mental health side and the impact it's had on us as a society. I'm hoping we've learned a lot from it and we'll get better so it doesn't happen the same way again. Yeah, it was just, there was just a New York Times story about uh, 
they've recorded now the lowest, I think, reading and math levels in decades wow. because uh, the kids weren't in school. So that's that's wow. not, not a good thing. Uh, yeah. One last thing, as a news guy, uh, you turn on the news, you turn on CNN right now or MSNBC or Fox News, and you're going to hear something about Trump or something about Biden. Um, we, there was a time when we heard about ISIS and Al Qaeda. We almost never hear those two names again. Are we becoming lax as a society, forgetting that these terrorists are out there? Uh, as a society, maybe. I think what just highlights people put in the news what sells ad space. I'm a big believer in, in that's exactly what it is. If if what's trending is what's going to sell ad space. And if right now, if because the Russians have done such a fantastic job of active measures of pitting us against each other mm -hmm. during, you know, there was no collusion. I, I'm being a Russian guy my entire life. I knew there was never collusion because Russians don't take sides of any Americans. They hate all Americans. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they sow distrust in our organizations, our institutions and each other because they did a great job of pitting against each other. And it's never been that divisive than it has been now. And that kind of divisiveness sells. It's like watching a car wreck. Pe people a lot of times watch these horrendous things because they want to see the wreck. And that's what we're watching right now. I think once it, it'll take something else that distracts the attention to to move away from that. You know, and like you've been covering you know, the, the tragic uh, things that are going on with the Titanic sub yeah. you know, that went down there. Well, yeah. that's it's tragedy and tragedy sells ad space, unfortunately. And so I think the next tragic thing, whether it's terrorism or something else, will take it, take it back again. Yeah, well, Russia is a whole different topic. We'll get you back on that. Uh, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, if you don't know him, you know him now. Robin Dreek is a best-selling author, a professional speaker, a trainer, an executive coach, a podcast host, a Marine Corps officer, a retired FBI special agent. He was chief of the counterintelligence behavior analysis program. One of his many jobs, uh, as you heard, was recruiting spies. He's also gone by it, author of The Code of Trust. And it's not all about me. My mother always said, it's not all about you, Joel. So every time I, hear that title, <laughs> I think about that, uh, Robin, thank you for your service uh, to our nation. Thank you for your time. And uh, he's an all around great guy. Thank you, Robin. Uh, love you, America, especially on a story like this. Until next time.